not let me go probably sums up what Hosea is all about. It's mainly about God's love for faithless Israel. He was prepared to go to the utmost to redeem them and bring them back in spite of all their waywardness and their fornication and idolatry which really angered him. And the message is of Hosea's life himself. No, not got it. The next is the um, plan. There we are. This is how we're going to look at it tonight. The man, Hosea, his time he lived in and his message to all of us really and to Israel at that time. We have a map of the land, which will come up eventually. If you don't, it don't really matter. There we are. We're talking mainly about Hosea was the only prophet to actually live in Israel. It's thought he lived um, probably the mi- near, in the middle near Samaria, somewhere over there the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, Amos also prophesied, but he lived down in Bethel, which is right down the bottom. So we have, let's first of all consider the man. Probably well to have your Bibles open at chapter 1, so you can follow through. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Beri, during the reigns of various kings. So let's consider the man, his name. Hosea means a, it's a form of Joshua, Jesus, or Joseph, and it means Yahweh saves. Beri, that's a fountain or well. I don't think there's any significance in that. Um, I couldn't find any, so uh, his father doesn't seem to have counted as uh, probably just where he lived or what his occupation was or what he did um, as a man. He was contemporary with quite a number of the prophets. He was contemporary with Amos, who I mentioned, who lived in Bethel. He was contemporary with Isaiah and Micah and Jonah. Um, All these prophesied, obviously, to the two tribes of Judah in the south, whereas Hosea was prophesying to the ten tribes in the north. What did he do? Did he have a job? Most commentators think that he was a professional, um, probably what we would class a middle, middle, um, middle class man of this day and age. Um, some have suggested he might have been in the baking trade because... Uh, um, Chapter 7 speaks quite a bit about um, they are all adulterers burning like an oven whose fire the baker need not stir from the need of the dough till it rises and, and various things like that. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire all of them are hot as an oven. Um, references thinking he might have been a baker but nothing concrete to go on. It's times. What time did he prophesy? He lived in the northern kingdom and he prophesied from 780 to 720 BC. Quite a long period, one of the older ones of the uh, long period of time that the prophets did. And first of all, I want to mention that he was the minor prophets. The other were classed as major prophets because probably their message was stronger and more uh, dynamic than the prophecy of uh, these 12 minor prophets. The grouping was done uh, by, obviously, some of the Israeli uh, historians and such like that. They put them into this assembly. It's not that Osea was probably first or last. It probably was that, uh, let's say, they put it together so he prophesied probably 
from 780 to 720, 60 years. And it, it might not have been right to the end, but he certainly prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam the second. Jeroboam the second reigned for 40 years. It was one of the um, longest reigns. And it was a, it was a, a very prosperous reign. It was a time when uh, everything was going well and the nation was enjoying prosperity. People were living um, lives of ease and comfort, which probably brought about the loose living that they were uh, engaged in. So he prophesied during Jeroboam's reign, who reigned for 40 years, then from 740 to 720 BC, there was a, a spate of kings, probably six altogether between 740 and 720. Four were murdered by their successors, that was Zechariah, Shalom, Pekiah, Pekah. One Oshir was captured in battle, and only one Menahem was succeeded on the throne by his son Pekahiah, who was killed by Pekah who tried to form an alliance with Egypt. So, not a very settled uh, time for Israel. Twenty years of much confusion, of uh, murder, short reigns by the kings, and eventually, because Pekar tried to form an alliance, Israel were dismembered by tiglath pileser the Assyrian, in 733 BC. So the Toth path went and only the territories of Ephraim and Manasseh, which were lower down, picture's gone, so we'll skip that. <laughs> only the territories of Ephraim and Manasseh were left to Israel. And then because of this loyalty of Oshia, uh, the last sort of king, Samaria was captured and the people expelled and taken into the land of Assyria in 722-720. So the northern tribe came to an end at that time. God had withdrawn his aid and his uh, concern. His concern continued, but his uh, support for them was withdrawn and they were subjected to discipline and punishment. So we've got the time, we've got the sort of setting, so we come now to his message. As the title said, this is a love that would not let go. And that's really the theme of Osea. A love that would not let go even in spite of Israel's perversity and Israel's... Uh, going after other gods, which God had said right from <laughs> Mount Sinai, they had this tendency to make gods, to make calves, golden calves or bulls, as the, the practice was. The book is to emphasise God's unchanging love for his covenant people. They had broken the covenant. The covenant made at Sinai, they would be his people, he would be their God, he would be their father, he would be their husband, and they would be his bride, and they had turned away from it. Yet in spite of their continuing sin rebellion, God used Osea's own experiences to emphasise, to show how great his love was for this people. Quite a number of the prophets were involved with this, weren't they? Ezekiel <laughs> Uh, we were talking the other week, had to lay on his side for over a year and then on his left side. Uh, the things he had to eat, he had to make a hole in the wall as though he was uh, going out in night time to show what came up to the king. Jeremiah had to wear the linen waistband until it became marred and dirty, signifying what would happen to Judah. And Osea uses 
God used those seers' lifestyle to speak of his love and his concern for his people, Israel. So if you know Seir chapter 1, we have now the a short history. There's not a lot said about Seir really, only his lifestyle uh, is uh, what happened to him. So we read in verse 2, when the Lord began to speak through Seir, the Lord said to him, go take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery and departed from the Lord. So he married Goma, daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Some find it, some commentators, I don't know what we think, but uh, some commentators find it hard that t- to sort of swallow that God would tell this faithful prophet to take a prostitute as a wife. Some try to uh, soften the pill or coat the pill with sugar by saying, well, probably she was part of the cult prostitutes that this, um, the Baal worship engaged in. But it seems, on the whole, I think that God did ask Osir to take a prostitute to be his wife. <coughs> to pinpoint, to show, to say, look Israel, this is where you are. You've prostituted my love for you. And you've gone off to other lovers. So he married Goma, which means complete. It doesn't seem to offer much uh, other than that. Goma conceived, verse 6, again and gave birth to, sorry, verse 4. So he married Goma, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to her, say, call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. <coughs> Jezreel, it's the same as it actually means Israel, or it also can mean God scatters. And it's talking here of Israel's history concerning uh, the ace of Hayab. If you'd like to go to 2 Kings chapter 9, This is God scattering, that's what the word Jezebel means, God scatters. Second Kings chapter 9. Um, the prophet Elisha had come into the company of uh, the, the, the young men and uh, he went into the army officers sitting together, verse 5, and uh, he said, I've come to talk to one of you. And, uh, he takes Jehu outside and anoints him with oil. And Elisha says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ab, your master, and I avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the ser- Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ab will perish. I will cut off from Ab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I'll make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Asher, son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, dog will devour in the plot of grain at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. And so the judgment to come upon, which happened in Jezreel, and it's taken this sort of imagery of the boy called Jezreel, God scatters. And it was here that Israel would be broken by this Syrian host in BC 733. So when he says the, the bow of Israel will be broken, that's what he was pointing forward to. He's pointing forward to 
the destruction that would come upon the house of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. And there it was that the Assyrians attacked, massacred, killed and took prisoner a lot of the Israelis. Here Israel was broken. Back to Osea. One thing to note about the birth of this son, Jezreel, is that the words say, so he married Goma, daughter of Dibalan, and she conceived and bore him a son. So we're sure that the first, this son, was actually Osea's son. But it never says that again. And so we have the feeling that Goma probably was continuing a prostitution and these the next two were not actually born as sons of the daughters and son of Osea, but of her lovers. So Goma conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Osea, Call her Loru Hama, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. And then he, that's when he sort of refers to Judah, who continued quite a time, I will show love to the house of Judah, and I will save them. And so, here God is taking the, this daughter, using her, giving her a name, as the Lord gives names which have meanings to those who are important in his uh, plan of things. Call her Loru Harmai, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel. A drastic. And if they could have taken it on board, they were moving it would have been for the northern host of Israel. Thirdly, I should read Lo Rama, verse 8, Goma had another son. And the Lord said, Call him Lo Army, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. You are not my people. Here the Lord is saying, You are no longer my people. Your lifestyle has separated me from you and you will be given over and taken into captivity. And yet, it's lovely, isn't it, often with the prophets, um, you get this sort of picture of doom and and sort of sadness and tragedy and uh, judgment, and yet God always (laughs) leaves a little nugget at something to brighten up, um, give them hope, to give the people hope as he always gives all his children hope. Um, going on to verse 10 of chapter 1, yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it says to you, are not my people, making use of uh, the names of the children, where you are not my people, they will call sons of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will be reunited. And they will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land. For great will be the day of Jezreel. I'm looking forward to um, Israel and Judah's reconciliation and becoming the people of God once again. If we move on to chapter 2. Let's talk a bit about what was wrong with Israel. Most of the chapters are dealing with Israel's uh, worshipping of false gods, of the Baals, of the gods of fertility. And amongst all that, there was sexuality and all that sort of free living and loose living was all part of... uh, what the people were indulging in. There was prostitutes in the, in the temples, both male and female, and the people seemed to like it so. And, and some of the warnings that God gives to Israel is not only just for the people, but for the king and 
for the princes also. Chapter 2, verse 4. This obviously came later on God, when Osir was passing messages on to his people um, through the prophet Osir, telling them what was wrong, what was going wrong. Verse 4, I will not show my love to our children because they are the children of adultery. Um, partly, you see, Osir's family relationships these children were not, they were children of adultery. Their mother has been unfaithful, has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I'll go after my lovers who give me food and water. And the old sense is that she sought, not the Lord, but she sought her lovers, which were uh, the idol worship, the Baals, the offerings to false gods. And Goma had gone off after her lovers. Verse 13. I'll punish her for the day she burned incense to the bales. She decked herself with rings and jewellery and went after her lovers. That these she forgot, declares the Lord. Obviously Goma, but also Israel. They're going away from the Lord and, and seeking pleasures. Uh, they, they couldn't stand the, the rigour of... Uh, Worshipping Yahweh, they found it much easier to enjoy the pleasures of the time and indulge in them to excess. If you go on to verse 23 of that, it, it, again there's a lovely little picture. The Lord sort of bringing them back and saying, they will know what you like and I'm going to have to abandon you. It's not the end. This is a love that is endearing. It will never let go, like the title says on the uh, Osea. Verse 23, I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved ones. Again, you see, using the name of the children. L Low army, meaning not my people. I will say to the army, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Dovsis has taken some time. She had three children. Uh, the, the, the Israelites had periods of weaning, so that probably a couple of years at least. So we're talking probably six or seven years was passing by whilst she was having these children, but she was also meeting her lovers. She was getting her pleasures from the lovers of those around her. Chapter 3, she'd gone off. She'd left Osea. She'd left him with the children. She'd gone off to uh, live with her lovers, to indulge in all the practices that they uh, were indulging in. And it would seem as though she was abandoned, but that's not the image that had to be portrayed because God was sort of saying, I'm, I will not let you go, I will not abandon you, Israel. Though I may have punished you for what, I will not abandon you. And chapter 3 speaks of those serious reconciliation with his wife. The Lord wanted Osir to appreciate his love for Israel. So he said to Osir, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and an adulteress. What a hard thing for a husband to do. The one thing, the love of his wife, is the greatest, the most precious thing. She had, in a way, thrown that in his face and gone off. Yet God is saying, you've got to love her. Show your love again as I will show my love to Israel. Though she is loved by another and adulteress, you must go. Love her, here's the key. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. That's a bit of a odd thing, isn't it? <laughs> raisin cakes. <laughs> but that's what they <laughs> used to uh, offer to the um, fertility goddess, I think. 
verse 2. So I brought her for 15 shekels of silver and a bet of homer and a lisek of barley. Now those two, the 15 shekels of silver and the value of the omer of barley was also 15 shekels. So don't take much calculation that he purchased her from the slave market where she was for 30 pieces of silver. And we know how our Lord, the value of our Lord was put at 30 pieces of silver price a slave. See, oh, see his great love, it, it, it took her back. But she needed to be corrected. She needed to have a time of discipline, of uh, being probably restrained or take that wildness out of her. So I said, verse 2, and then I told her, you are to live with me for many days. You must not be a prostitute or intimate with any man and I will live with you. So he took her back into his home and he kept her quietly out of the public eye for quite a length of period until she'd calmed down, until she'd become reconciled, until she began to realise that this was the real love. Her husband, Osea, showed her what real love was, not the love of her lovers who only loved her for herself. But Osea loved her because she was his wife and she was precious to him as the Lord was trying to indicate Israel were precious to him. Verse 5, Afterwards the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. The next section is chapter 4 to 13. Rather a long period At the first, yes. What we're going to do now, Stuart's going to, obviously it's too much for us to go through uh, ten chapters, because it, it, it's, it's a sort of re- repetition of um, God saying about their unfaithfulness. And so we're going to uh, go through these chapters 4 to 13 briefly, Try to get out what we can of God's condemnation, his judgment, and his then treatment, his pleading with them. So, as I say, we can only pick up the important passages, so we'll go through them together as uh, Stuart puts them on the screen for us. This is what they were doing. This is chapter 4. The Lord has a controversy with Israel. Look what you've been up to. There's no truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God in the land. Totally abandoned. Swearing, lying, killing, stealing, committing adultery. There was hardly anything redeemable in the life of Israel at that time. The land shall mourn, everyone that dwells through shall languish. It was a time of real degradation, of complete abandonment of the Lord God which started, obviously, with Jeroboam putting the calves at Dan and Bethel and leading Israel astray right from that time. It wasn't just the people. It was the priests. It was the king. It was, they were all in it together. Let let no man strive nor approve another for thy peer as they strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee, and I will destroy thy mother. He keeps returning back to Goma, uh, using the picture of O.C. and his wife. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You often we've heard that, haven't we? Without vision, the people perish. They've rejected knowledge. They didn't want to listen anymore. They found the Yahweh, Yahweh's ways too hard for them. They didn't want to listen to the prophets. As we know, they did down in the south. When Jeremiah kept speaking, they didn't want to listen to him. They wanted to hear soft words. They wanted words that were comforting to them. Not something that was the, <laughs> set their backs up and, and made them unhappy. 
My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. I don't know quite who the priests were, uh, what worship was going on, but obviously there was probably a form of worship by Isaiah, but uh, polluted by the life that's going on by the people. Picking up again, my people destroyed for lack of knowledge. They re rejected knowledge. As they were increased, as they became more, so they sinned against me. Therefore I will change their glory into shame. What they thought was glory is shameful. And they shall be like people like priests. That they would follow each other. There would be no one to pull them back from their, uh, the, this uh, degradation they were going into. They shall commit all of which they did. Because they've left off to take heed to the Lord. They no longer listen to the Lord. They didn't want to hear. They blocked up their ears. They often, the prophets had to say that you, you draw near me with your hearts. But you, you draw me with your, your, with your lips and your words. But your heart is far from me. You, you, you're not even in your heart acknowledging me. You're just going through the motions of being worshippers. And this is what they were doing. Hoard them and wine and new wine, take away the art. <coughs> wine is always a part of uh, liberality, of a loosening of morals. And they were indulging in the new wine to a great extent. They'd left off to take heed to the Lord. My people ask Cain their stocks. They, they go to the wooden image. <laughs> How many times they got off to say to them, look, you cut down a tree, <laughs> you make an image of it, and you burn what's left on the fire and you, and you cook your meal on it. Can't you see? This stock is nothing. There's nothing in this stock. Why do you bury down to them? They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains. They did and they burn incense upon the hills under oaks, poplars and elms because the shadow there is good. Is good. The shadow on the tree, they could be getting up to what they like to <laughs> because they were in the groves. They were hidden away. No, we could see them and say so they got up to all their adultery. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom and your spaces shall commit adultery. So this is what he had to say to them. And the pride of Israel does testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. And he brings in Judah now because he could see what would eventually happen to Judah. Judah also would fall into this um, apostate way would eventually be taken captive by the Babylonians they have dealt treacherously against the Lord for their begotten strange children again Goma had begotten strange children lower army an army who were not Osir's children <coughs> Osir chapter 5 if you'd like to turn to us here, chapter 5, we can see here. Uh, it's really carrying on with the... That's quite right, is it, Stuart? This is judgment against Israel, not to... Uh, the glory which uh, God promised for them. It's probably chapter 6, verse 5. Therefore I cut you in pieces, my prophets, I killed you with the words of my mouth, my judgments flash like lightning upon you. This is what I desire. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and not a of God, rather than burnt offerings. That's what the Lord is looking for. That he Ephraim and should come back to him. Oh, six. So they said, Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Again, the Lord is saying, I will eventually bring you back to myself Israel you'll not be left forever I will heal you bind you up 
make you whole again. When he would have healed Israel, <laughs> then the iniquity of Ephraim would discover the wickedness of Samaria. They didn't consider that God was got his eye on them. They considered not in their hearts that I remember all the wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about they are before my face. And the people even corrupted the king, though I don't think the king took a lot of corrupting because he himself was not a good king, though he had a prosperous reign. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, as an oven eaten by the baker. So again he's saying, a continuous message. The fact that he had to keep saying it probably indicates that Israel was not taking any heed to his message at all. And their religion was, do what you like. That, that's what they were saying. We'll do what we like. We'll not listen to the Lord. We'll go after those other others. We'll enjoy the land and we'll enjoy the wine and we'll enjoy the prosperity we have at this time. Set the trumpet to thy mace, he shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord. That was a Syria, of course, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. The covenant they had with God was that they would be his people. As they said at Sinai, all the Lord has commanded us, we will do. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Israel has cast off the sins of good, the enemy shall pursue him. They said they knew God, but they did nothing to serve him or worship him. And so what did they look for? They looked for reward. But the time would come when they would suffer for 20 years. As I said, there was four kings, one after another, murdered by the one who took over from them. And eventually he said to them, you shall not dwell in the Lord's land. Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. He kept warning them, this is not going to continue, Israel. You're going to be taken captive. So that was what the promise to them. If this was to happen, Israel would be cut down like a thistle. And they will be so afraid, they'll say, cover us until the hills fall on us. Wasn't it Deuteronomy where they said they'll ask for the day to come and for the night to cover them and there'll be no ease, no rest for them. And we know over Israel through their 2,000 years of persecution had that feeling within them. They had no security, nowhere safe, nowhere where they could really call home. Everywhere the hand of the oppressor was against them. And yet we come to what the Lord God thought of his people Israel. When Israel was a child and I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. That was God's love. He brought Israel out of the burning furnace of Egypt from their slavery. And he called them a son. Remember how he said he brought the Lord Jesus out of Egypt. I called my son out of Egypt. But they sacrificed unto Balaam and burnt incense to graven images. They didn't realise. They attributed their blessings to false gods, not to the God of Israel. They knew not that I healed them. I was the one that healed them and looked after them. I drew them a cause of man with bonds of love. And I was to them as that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I lay meat unto them. Again, with all this condemnation and forewarning of doom, God comforts them and puts uh, thoughts into the prophets' mouths that might be of comfort to them. Bands of love, what a lovely thought. So he's getting towards the end of his 
we don't know how long he was in prophesying. I mean, he was in the land a long time, probably 50, 60 years. He had said to them, how shall I give you up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver you, Israel? My heart is turned within me, my repentings are kindled together. I will not execute the fierce of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God. I'm not you, he said, I'm not like you. I don't take that sort of vengeance. I will not destroy totally. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of you. And I will not enter the city. I will work out your salvation eventually. So, the last section was on Hosea 14. Israel's sin had been outlined to, out, laid out some, they knew exactly where they stood. They had prostituted their relationship with God, and God was angry with them, was about to send them into captivity from where they never returned. But we know that eventually they will return because God has promised that Israel and Judah, two sticks, will be joined together. So let's just look through chapter 14 to conclude with. Call upon repentance to bring blessing. I can bless you. Repent. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Of course they are. Take words with you. Think upon me. Think of what my prophets have said and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria cannot save us. Certainly wouldn't save them because Israel was going to take them into captivity. We will not make war or sin. We will not. We will never again say our gods to these Baals, to what our own hands have made. For in you the Father is fine compassion. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. This is real love, just like Osea could love Goma after all their infidelity and all the going after other lovers. He loved her, and that love the Lord God was trying to show Israel is the love I have for you. I will never let you go. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from them. I'll be like the Jew to Israel, but no refreshing the Jew is. Blossom like a lily, like a seed of Lebanon, will send down his roots. His splendour be like an olive tree, his fragrance like a seed of Lebanon. A time of restitution and of glory is yet to come for Israel. But it certainly will come, and the signs are that it's on its way quite soon, brothers and sisters. So the final words for us are the first, last words. We can take this to ourselves. Who is wise? He will realise these things. Well, think about them and ponder upon them. Who is discerning? They look at the ways of Israel. They're turning from God. They're serving of worthless idols. Turning from the living God. A lesson for us all. We can serve worthless idols. We don't cut a tree and make an uh, idol out of it, but we all can have idols in our lives, things which can take us away, and things which will give us the pleasure that we should seek from the Lord God. Who is discerning? He will understand that. He will understand the ways of the Lord. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. And we pray that we shall walk in the ways of the right.